Uh, good evening, church, and a special good morning to you, John. Thank you for getting up early, early to uh, be with us tonight. Tonight we get session number four with John Oakes on the book of Revelation. And thank you so much, John, for teaching us these past three weeks. We have all learned from you, and we truly look forward tonight. And thank you for blessing us with your biblical knowledge. I can truly say that we are better disciples from spending time with you these past three weeks. And we very much look forward to tonight, and I look forward to uh, many more questions from our team. Uh, but before we start, please uh, join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, uh, the, just God, there's so much going on in the world, God, and, and help us always remember that you are in control. And when we're discouraged, when we wonder how these things are happening, help us to remember that and keep that foremost in our mind. I want to especially pray tonight for all those battling the dreaded COVID. Especially want to pray for our, our council leaders, uh, Jomar and Marie, God. Please, please, God, just, just, just be, be with them and, and uh, watch over them and their family and help them to recover from this. God, I want to pray for our good, dear friends, Mo and Terry Adami. Uh, God, the inevitable is getting close for Terry. Please give them uh, strength. Please give them courage. And uh, God, help them know that we are all praying for them. Their family is with them, and their family is pulling for, for them. God, help us always remember that this world is not our home. You have a great, great place for us, and that should bring us wonderful joy and help us through all these difficult times. But especially tonight, God, thank you for John. Thank you for him spending his time and sharing with us and help us have open hearts and open minds and help us learn so much so that we can share with others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hello, everybody. Um, I, one thing I have to say is you guys ask really good questions. Pressed by that. Okay, are we going to get lucky? Yes. Great. Well, welcome back for class number four. You know, uh, tonight we're going to kind of, uh, we have an expression in America, get into the weeds. Tonight we're going to get into the section where you could easily uh, get distracted by the details. So I want us to maintain the big picture. Remember, in apocalyptic literature, you don't want to get too focused on every little detail. We'll talk about most of those little details, but you've got to maintain the big picture. So I want us to take us back to the first week. The theme of Revelation is this, peel back the layers of history and the persecutions. And what do you find? God is on the throne and the lamb is at the center of the throne room of God. God's in control. We need to understand what's going on up in heaven, despite what's going down here on the earth. The message of Revelation is be encouraged and be faithful to Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. And the purpose is for us to be comforted in times of per persecution and times of trials. And I know our brothers and sisters there in the Middle East experience more than their share of persecutions and trials. And so I believe that this book is particularly relevant right now. So then Revelation then has this apocalyptic literature. It's, it's like a divine comic book, a picture book, dramatic. Like I said, Romans appeals to the mind, Psalms appeals to the emotions, and Revelation appeals to the imagination. Now, I, I, another slide I want to review is the one that kind of describes the, the structure of Revelation 6 through 19. Uh, actually, 6 through 16 here. So last week, we saw the seven seals. And that was a partial judgment, a fourth of the land, a fourth of the air. So a, a partial judgment. God is judging, but with the, with the goal of getting people still to repent. And then uh, tonight, we'll have the seven trumpets, Revelation 8 and 9. So the seventh seal opens the seven trumpets. And then the seventh trumpet will announce the seven bowls. But between the seven trumpets and the seven bowls, which are the final outpouring of God's judgment, for which it's too late, we'll see these seven symbolic 
creatures, the beast out of the earth, the beast out of the sea, the, the dragon, and, and, the, and the great prostitute, and these, these different sort of mystical, mythical creatures that are opposing God's church. Okay, so that's going to be the structure. We should do uh, uh, chapters 8 through 10, and hopefully also chapter 11. I hope we'll get that far. So let's get into Revelation uh, 8 and 9. So these are the trumpets. And you have to understand the significance of a trumpet to Israel. The trumpet is a warning of coming judgment. The, the Jews would blow the trumpet on the day of the Lord. It's reminiscent of the Feast of Trumpets, also known as Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah, which was the Jewish New Year, but it was a celebration of the New Year, but also a foreshadowing of the coming of God in judgment. And so the rabbis advised the Jewish people to, uh, because it would come at the, at the breakout of the new moon. And they, they weren't sure ahead of time exactly when the new moon would come. So the rabbi would warn the Jews to pull an all night or step all night because they want to be ready. They don't know the day or the hour of God's coming. And you can see there and what the Jews were doing, it, it reminds us of what Jesus said to us. We don't know the day or the hour when God comes. So this trumpet is, is a sounding of a warning of God coming in judgment. But in this case, the judgment is going to come on God's enemies on Rome. In Numbers 10, 5, it says the trumpets were used to sound the alarm. It reminds us of Matthew 25, 30 through 31. The trumpet sound, the call will sound, and also 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14. So this whole idea of the sounding of the warning of coming judgment applies perfectly, of course, in Revelation 8 and 9. Also, another comment is, uh, we're going to look at the four judgments on, on the earth and the two judgments on man, but these judgments are reminiscent of the plagues of Egypt. I'll, I'll make note of that as we go through it. It's not an accident, because basically, the plagues came on Egypt, on Pharaoh, because they were resisting God's people worshiping him. And Rome is resisting God's people worshiping him. And so the plagues that fell on Egypt and on, on the Pharaoh, because he, he would not let them worship God, are similar to the plagues coming on, on Rome. So it makes sense. All right. <coughs> Susie, let's get into the text. Revelation chapter 8. Should be some good stuff here. All right. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Like I said, the seventh seal opens the seven trumpets. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel... Uh, who had a, a golden censer, censer would hold incense, uh, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So there's silence in heaven for half an hour. Okay, you know, I don't know about taking all that literally, but a half means a limited amount of time. So basically what that represents to me is God is holding back his judgment. God is slow to anger and merciful. He does not delight in bringing uh, judgment on the wicked. Second Peter uh, 3, verse 9. Let's turn there quickly. 2 Peter 3, 9. This period of, of silence, this, this dramatic period of silence, it, because God is, is getting us to anticipate what's coming up. 2 Peter 3, 9, which says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. So basically this waiting is, is, is symbolic of God hoping and that we will repent before he brings judgment on us. 
And in Ezekiel 33, 11, where God says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So an angel comes with seven trumpets and the, and the saints are praying, which is, seems like what we're doing all the time in heaven. And what are we praying for? We'll go back to Revelation 6, verse 10, where we're praying, how long, O God, before you come and judge our enemies, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. I think that's what they're praying. The, the prayers of the saints are rising up in the form of this incense. What are they praying for? For God to come and judge his enemies. But God waits for half an hour, but then the seven trumpets sound. And I'll tell you this, one of the messages I get from Revelation 8 is, don't you dare go after my saints. That's what God says. Because if you do, it's not gonna go well for you. All right, so then in verse five, we hear thunder and rumblings. All this portends a coming judgment. All right, now, so now we're gonna have the first four trumpets. And the first four trumpets are judgments on nature. The fifth and the sixth will be judgments on people. The first four are judgments on nature. Uh, in the ancient world, they would divide the world or nature, if you will, into the land, the seas, the fresh water and the air or the heavens. So we'll have a judgment on the land and on the sea and on the fresh water on the air. So basically it's judgment on the whole physical world. At least that's the symbolism here. Got it? So let's read uh, the, the, the trumpets starting in verse six. Then the seven angels who had seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet and there came hail and fire mixed with blood. It was hurled down on the earth. As I'm reading these, imagine which of the Egyptian plagues is going on here. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded his trumpet in something like a huge mountain. All the blaze was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned to blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Then the third angel sounded his trumpet. A great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky uh, on a third of the rivers and on the springs of the water. The name of the star is Wormwood and a third of the waters turned bitter and many people died from the waters that became bitter. Then the fourth angel sounded his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck. Remember, earth, seas, water, sky. A third of the moon and a third of the stars, so a third of them turned dark. And a third of the day was without light and a third of the night. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. So the first four trumpets are bad, but the next three trumpets are even worse. All right, and again, let's not get caught up too much in the weeds here. Get the big picture, judgment is coming. The, 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 the seals were on a fourth of the earth. These seals are on a third of the earth. So it represents a partial judgment. And we'll see at the end of chapter nine, the intention of God is that people would repent at this point. And presumably some did. So the first one, trumpet number one, is hail, fire, and blood, reminiscent of plague number seven. God goes after the crops. Woe to the land. A third of the earth, again, a limited effect. And then trumpet number two, the sea is turned into blood. God goes after the sea, reminiscent of plague number one in Egypt. Woe on the water, on the seas. God's going after the commerce because Rome relied on the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean was the highway for commerce for Rome. A mountain is ablaze and it's thrown into the sea. Uh, and probably this mountain, which always represents great cities, great power, Proudly represented Rome and their spiritual and their national power. Uh, and, and maybe they even thought of Mount Vesuvius, which had uh, erupted about 10, 15 years before Revelation was written. And then the third trumpet, and the fresh water becomes bitter. Woe to the fresh water and, and wormwood, which is this bitter water, which is a reference to Jeremiah 9.15, if you want to look that up later. Right, and then the, the fourth trumpet in Revelation 8, 12. 
which is a, a, a judgment on heavenly objects, on the moon, on the sun, on the stars, and they're struck as well. And here it's reminiscent of the plague of darkness, a, a plague number nine. Woe on the heavens, again, a partial judgment. Uh, and it also reminds us of Isaiah 34, four through five, if you wanna get a you know, look at that scripture. And then an eagle says, an eagle uh, to, the, to the Jews was a bird of ill omen. And it's, he says, basically it's gonna get worse. He says, whoa, 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 bad news. Because trumpet number one through four was judgment, and judgment five and six is going to be judgment that comes on the people. And again, we'll see the Egyptian plagues in mind. Got it? So um, let's read Revelation 9, 1 through 12. So we're going to read, basically, Revelation 9 is trumpet number six, uh, five and six. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. Who is this fallen star, this fallen angel? I think you know who it is. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. Again, if we take this literally, this is crazy. How can a star have a key? So who holds the key to the abyss? I think you know. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it, like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss, and out of the smoke locusts came down on the earth, and they were given power like that of scorpions on the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads, going back to Revelation 7. They were not allowed to kill, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes. During those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. The locusts look like horses prepared for battle. On their heads, they wore something like crowns of gold. Their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair. Their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates breastplates of iron the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle they had tails with stingers like scorpions and in their tails they had power to torment people for five months they had a king over them and the angel of the abyss whose name in hebrew is abaddon and in greek is apollyon which is the destroyer the first woe is past. Two woes are yet to come. So Satan is granted power to wreak destruction on the earth. Later on in Revelation 19, we'll see he'll, he'll be give, given power for a thousand years of, of partial uh, judgment on the earth. So trumpet number five, the first of two judgments on men, these locusts which of course reminds us of plague number eight on Egypt, the first of the three woes. It's not a judgment on nature. It's interesting. These are locusts, right? He says, don't eat the grass, don't eat the plants. Did you ever hear of a locust that didn't eat plants? These are not your usual locusts, right? Then a fallen star, which is Satan, who controls the abyss, who controls hell. He is the king of the locusts. So these locusts are essentially demons. Demons that are given power over human beings to torment them. Demons that come from the abyss. Demons that do not worship God, obviously. And, 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 and by the way, they do not torture those who have that seal. Remember Revelation 7. And I believe a Christian cannot be possessed by a demon. I believe it's literally impossible. If we have the Holy Spirit living in us, Demons can influence us, but they definitely cannot uh, possess us. Uh, uh, this, uh, the sin, uh, the, the, this, the, the power of the locust makes people just loathe themselves because of their sin. And that's a, a common message throughout the Old Testament and in Revelation, that when God comes in judgment, the things that people love, their money, their gold, their, their power, 
that they will load those things and they will throw them into the street. We'll see that later on in the book of Revelation. And, and then we have this vision of these locusts. Again, don't get caught up in the details here. All right. So I, actually, I found a pretty good drawing that kind of represents what these locusts look like. I, I, it's kind of looks about right. All right. And this is the ruler of the kingdom of the air, Ephesians 2, verse 2. And in John 14, 30, Satan is called uh, the prince of this world. Abaddon, Apollyon, destroyer. Satan is at work even now in and through the corruption and decadence of Rome. In their case, the, the decadence of the rulers of the, um, uh, the whatever, what is it, eight different kingdoms there in the Gulf or whatever that is. There's a lot of corruption going on there. I probably should be a little bit careful what I say, so I'll just uh, be careful there. But uh, one of the commentators that I read said, the locusts represent the hellish rottenness, the internal decadence of the Roman Empire. That's what we're dealing with as Christians. In chapter 9, you can get kind of depressed. But this is the reality. This is the reality we're dealing with. But God is going to judge these people and, and these systems and, and these governments. All right? And besides, we have... Uh, Revelation 10 and 11, we're going to have another encouraging interlude coming up pretty soon, which we're going to need. All right, now we're going to have the seventh, I'm sorry, the sixth trumpet, which is the second of three woes. The third woe will be the seven bowls, okay? The sixth angel sounded his trumpet. I heard a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel uh, who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound to the great river Euphrates. By the way, this is probably a reference to Parthia. Remember I mentioned Parthia, the Parthian Empire, which is on the other side of the Euphrates from the Roman Empire. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day, month and year, were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000, which is 200 million. I heard their number. The horses and the riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, and yellow as sulfur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions. And out of their mouths came fire and smoke and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came from their mouths. The power of the horses was in their mouths and their tails. Their tails were like snakes having heads with which they inflicted injury. The rest of mankind who are not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the works of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols and money, idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, and their thefts. This is going to be the final straw, folks. The, the trumpets and the seals represent God coming in partial judgment so that there's still time to repent. And presumably some did. We don't see that here, but presumably some did. Some still were becoming Christians. But God is about, this is essentially your last chance. 200 million soldiers. Obviously, this is symbolic. A lot of soldiers. Very scary. And the lion's head, the fire and smoke and blazing sulfur and all this stuff. Did the Christians suffer as these judgments came on Rome? Absolutely they did. But they were sealed and they would be, they would not suffer the final judgment. They will be with God forever. All right. So still Rome did not repent. So therefore we're going to be at chapter 10. And basically, we're going to learn that it is too late. The time has come. Final judgment is going to come on Rome. Got it? All right. Uh, there's a picture of the Parthian Empire. Uh, that's the ones that are on the other side of the Euphrates. All right. So now we have our second encouraging interlude. We need a little bit of encouragement right now. So let me read uh, uh, Revelation 10. 
Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun. His legs were like fiery pillars. This is a much better angel than what we saw in Revelation 9, that's for sure. He, had, he was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He's planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion when he shouted. The voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. I sure wonder what he said. That is one of the few things that we're not allowed to hear or see in the book of Revelation, uh, kind of like um, uh, Daniel 12, where he says, seal this up and don't reveal it. Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and the land raised his right hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and is all in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, there will be no more delay. Judgment is coming, and it's coming now. But in the days when the seven angels about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more, go take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. Reminiscent of Ezekiel taking and eating a scroll, correct? I took the little scroll from the angel's hands and I ate it, tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I eaten it, my stomach turned sour. And I was told you must prophesy against many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. So uh, here we see this powerful angel who is on, on the right side, essentially. Got it? A mighty angel little scroll. And I, I believe what's intent, contained on this little scroll is Revelation 11 through uh, 22. Essentially, it's the rest of the book of Revelation. That's my speculation anyway. And, and the angel has it's got his feet in the sea and his foot in the land, representing this is a message to the whole earth. And here's the message, no more delay. Why not? Because judgment will not be delayed. Roman, the, the Rome has refused to repent. No more warnings. No more delay. And then he tells uh, John to eat the scroll, which, like I said, I believe is the message of the rest of Revelation, especially the message of the seventh trumpet, which contains in it the six bowls, of uh, the seven bowls. So basically he's saying to John, assimilate the message, understand it, so that you can present it to my people when, you, when this vision is done. So it's about things that are happen, about to happen to peoples and nations and kings. It'll be a judgment on God's enemies, and, but also a trial for God's people. Now, let, we're going to do Revelation 11. I think we'll probably, we may get to Revelation 12, but we'll definitely do Revelation 11. Uh, Revelation 11 is a very interesting chapter, and it's a direct message to God's people. The message is this. God will protect his people, but his people need to continue to testify to the truth. All right, so this is essentially a passage about our evangelism. It's about a, a passage about evangelism uh, despite great suffering and, and attacks from the enemy enemies of God. So we're continuing our encouraging interlude. Now, as we read chapter 11, you're going to go, this is encouragement? The answer is, yes, absolutely. This is encouragement. Because uh, the fact that we'll be persecuted is not reason to be discouraged. Because God will protect us. All right? So let's let's... Hey, we, we went through 9 and 10 pretty quickly, but let's kind of park here in chapter 11 and uh, get what's going on here. All right, and God is going to measure, and whenever God measures something, you'll see that in Ezekiel, you'll see it in Zechariah. When God measures something, that's something he's going to protect. That, that's, that's a consistent message there. I was given a reed, like a measuring rod, and I was told, 
go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers. Now, this temple and the altar is representing God's church in this case. But exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. 42 months. Let me see. Divide that by 12. Oh, that's three and a half. And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, which divided by 30 is 42 months. Clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees. Who are these two olive trees? Mm. And the two lampstands. Who are these two lampstands? And they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. Bye. Bye. They have the power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. By the way, that's my wife going off to jury duty. She's doing her civic duty today. So God measures the temple. It, which basically means God is going to protect his people. The people within that measuring line will not be destroyed by, by Rome or, or by the locusts or these terrible soldiers of, of, of chapter 9. But, and by the way, uh, examples of this would be Zechariah 2, 1 through 5, and also in um, uh, Ezekiel. All right. And uh, but he only protects the inner court in, in the in the temple in Rome. There was the court of the Gentiles, the court of women, court of men, uh, then the, 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 the court where the Levites could go. Holy place, most holy place. And the outer part, God is not protecting. What that means is, you know, God will allow the church to be overcome to a certain extent. Right. Rome will not be powerless. Rome will be able to defeat kind of the, the fringes, if you will, the, the weak in the church, the, the ones who are not strong in their faith. God, God is going to allow some people to be taken out, essentially. That's how I interpret that. The Gentiles will persecute the church. Presumably, that's a reference to Rome. And they will trample on the church, verse 2. But God will protect the heart of the church. Those who truly have faith, God will protect them. But it says the outer courts, they'll be trampled on for 42 months. And remember, um, Domitian made Christianity illegal. And they started uh, later on having to go in and, and give a sacrifice and, and, and uh, have incense to the gods and eat, uh, eat uh, uh, meat that had been sacrificed to an idol. And some of the Christians did that. In fact, in the third century, uh, perhaps as many as a majority, in some way compromised with what Rome asked them to do. All right, and so again, tr the trampling on the outer courts will be for 42 months. Don't take that literally, three and a half years. Three and a half years means for a limited period of time. There'll be a limited judgment on those, I believe, who are weaker in their faith, and but the church will be protected from that judgment 42 months 1260 days three and a half years sometimes called times time and half a time different ways to refer to that that shows up in revelation in a number of places three and a half years is the period the church will be persecuted in revelation 11 2. it's the period during which the two witnesses testify revelation 11 3 is the period over which the woman is nourished in the wilderness revelation 12 through 6 12 6 through 14 it's the period of time that the beast has authority over the earth in revelation 13 5 it's the time that the little horn which is domitian persecutes the saints and Daniel 7.25, and it's the period over which the abomination of desolation overcomes the Jews in the time of Antiochus Epiphanes and Daniel 
All right, so there's this repeating theme of a temporary period where God's people appear to be defeated by his enemies. And then there are these two witnesses. I really like these witnesses. These witnesses are encouraging. They're the church. These witnesses represent the church. During the time of trampling, the, the church, the core of the church is expect, in fact powerful. The church grew. During the worst persecutions of Rome, the church continued to grow. Okay? Uh, the two witnesses that were prophesied during this time. So there would be the persecution during this time, but then the church continues to prophesy. In Revelation 12, we learn that's how they overcame Satan by the word of their testimony. And the two olive trees, which is re reminiscent of Zechariah chapter 4. And the two olive trees represent, if you go to Zechariah 4, you'll see represents the kingly power and the priestly power. And Jesus is priest and king. All right. In Zechariah 4, 12 through 14, it says this represents the king and the priesthood which came together in Christ. It says that the two represent Zerubbabel, the royal power, and Joshua, the priestly power. And the two lampstands, again, represent the church. And in Zechariah 4, 4 through 6, it says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So the church will continue to testify to the kingly power of Jesus, to the priestly power of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will empower us. Why two witnesses? Are there literally just two people sharing their faith? No, come on. Again, the symbolism. Two represents power. The church will continue to have a powerful testimony despite the persecution and the suffering. Are you continuing to have a powerful testimony there in Dubai and Doha and Kuwait City and the other places, the place where Satan reigns? I hope you do. That's the symbolism. A, I, I love the symbolism of Revelation chapter 11. And verse 5 and 6, it talks about the power of this testimony. If anyone tries to harm you and you're testifying to the truth, fire will come from their mouths and devour their enemies. They have power to shut the heavens so it won't rain, reminiscent of what happened with Elijah, correct? All right, now let's, let's read the, the, uh, the next section. Let's read verse 7 through 12. Now, verse 7 through 12 is, is not quite as encouraging as 1 through 6. So let me tell you that. Now, uh, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. This is the first woe, right, back in chapter 9. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. This figuratism refers to Babylon, it refers to Egypt, and it refers to Rome and Sodom, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some of every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God will enter them. They stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. So it seems like the church had been completely and utterly defeated. And I'm sure the Roman power, Domitian and, and uh, Diocletian and all these other emperors, I'm sure they thought they had defeated God's church. But boy, were they wrong. So the Roman persecutor attacks the witness, the church. Some even die, right? Their bodies will lie on the street of the great city. This great city, which is Babylon, which is Sodom, which is Egypt, which is Rome. The, the, there's this line, the evil power, which is represented by Sodom, but also Rome. All these pictures, Rome, 
Babylon, Egypt, that all is a reference to Rome, the city ruled by Satan, Revelation 13, verse 7. The world will gloat over us. They'll think they have us defeated. Ah, oh, those Christians. <laughs> but God will, will raise us up from the dead. But temporarily, for three and a half days, as the church will survive the persecution. And then we'll be even more powerful than we were at first. The intense persecution will last for three and a half days. Is that literal? Of course not. It actually lasted quite a bit longer than that uh, during, the, during the time of the Roman Empire. And again, another cross-reference would be Ezekiel 37, where you've got the valley of dry bones, and God breathes his spirit in them, and they're raised from the dead. God. You know, John the Baptist said God could turn stones into children of Abraham. The church will be triumphant. And you are those two witnesses. And that's your job. And, you know, the church has suffered. Some of your members have even died of COVID. And, and I don't know the other persecutions that have gone on. But God is assuring you. Remember that measuring line. He will protect you. And you will overcome, verse 11 and 12, the church will come back seemingly from the dead. And the saints will be victorious. I love chapter 11. All right. But unfortunately, we're going to go back to the third woe. All right. We're going to go back to the third woe. Let's read Revelation 11. Uh, let's read 13 and 14, and then we'll read the rest of the chapter in a second. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake. By now, you know what earthquakes portend, right? So we're going to get back to judgment. Because what's going to come is the seven bowls. But we're going to have like five chapters of interlude. It's a little confusing. You could get confused with Revelation a little bit because he's basically this earthquake, this rumbling, is looking forward to chapter 15 and 16. <laughs> when the bowls come. All right, anyway, 7,000 people were killed. I'm sorry, that very hour, there was a severe earthquake and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe was passed. The third woe is coming. Well, one of the things I skipped, I want to go back there at verse 10. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented them. I, sometimes those we share our faith with think we're tormenting them. Maybe your neighbor feels like you torment them. You're constantly asking the church and, and you know, sharing about your life and all that kind of stuff. You know, are you tormenting a few people just by being a disciple? Perhaps so. So finally, even Rome acknowledged the church in verse 13. Even Rome said, wow, you know, this... This church is amazing, actually, and gave glory to God, which happened after 13, after, I'm sorry, after uh, 312 AD, Rome actually made the church legal, and we even had an emperor who acknowledged Jesus, that would be Constantine. All right, so now we're going to have our fourth worship. I believe it's our fourth worship, um, which is going to start in, in verse 15. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there, was, there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the king of our Lord and his Messiah. Again, what, what, this is the message of Revelation. Despite whatever happens, the final outcome is assured. And the Roman, Rome will, will repent at the end, although it may be too late for them. You know, uh, like in Philippians, every knee shall bow and tongue confess. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah and will remain, reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Amen. Jesus is reigning even now. The nations were angry. And your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name. 
both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the Ark of his Covenant, and there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. And what's happened here is Revelation part one has ended. And Revelation part two is about to start. Oh, yes. Part two. Because in uh, verse in chapters 6 through 11, we've had the vision of what's going down on down here at the earth. So the opening scene, if you will, if you will, after, uh, you know, Revelation 4 and 5, when we kind of start. So 6 through 11, it's kind of like review uh, vision of what's going on in the church, to the church, on the earth. So it's going to happen starting in 12. We're going to like open up our vision. And now we're going to see what's going on, not down on the earth, but we're going to start to see what's going on behind the scenes, up in heaven. So that's this change of scenery, right? Uh, then God's temple in heaven was opened, right? So just imagine in, in, we, in chapter six, we had sort of the, the curtain open on the earth as we came into the seven uh, scrolls. And here in chapter 12, another curtain is opening. This is the curtain opening up what's going on in heaven. So this is sort of cool. We're getting a behind the scenes view. It's kind of like if you come here to LA, go to the Universal Studios, you get to see behind the scenes there. Kind of like that. I don't know if that's a great analogy, but it's the one I'm using right now. So through chapter 11 is kind of what's going on up front. Starting in chapter 12, it's what's going on behind the scenes. And we're going to find out there's a battle going on in heaven, which corresponds to the battle that's going on in the earth. Now, I don't have time to finish Revelation 12. Let me just kind of set the scene for Revelation 12. And I'm going to, st I'm going to stop in just a couple minutes. But let, let me just kind of set the scene. A great sign appeared now in heaven, right? Not on the earth. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant. She cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns on its heads. So we're about to see a battle in heaven. And this woman, she represents more than one thing. This, this woman who will uh, be in a battle, in essence, against the great serpent, is, which is Satan. Who is this woman with the 12 stars and who's standing on the moon and all this kind of stuff? Here's another picture of the woman fighting against the beast with seven heads and 12 horns and all that sort of stuff. Well, first of all, she's Israel who gave birth to the son, to Jesus. She's Israel. She's the Virgin Mary, but she's also the church. And she's the kingdom of God. The, in, in Revelation 12, the imagery is going to... It's hard to keep up with the imagery. And we're going to do that next, next Tuesday. But that basically, then we're going to see this heavenly battle between the kingdom of God on the one hand and Satan on the other. And let me tell you who wins. I think you know who wins, right? You know who's going to win. All right, so we'll call that enough for now. Uh, I, I have decent self-control, so we have maybe 10 or 15 minutes for some Q&A. Thanks, everybody. And I'll stop the share. Thank okay. you, Brother John Oaks. Thank you so much for taking us through session number four. And again, reassuring us, you know, there will be persecution, but there's victory after all in the end. Thank you for setting up, uh, setting us up with uh, your message uh, this evening or this morning in LA for yourself. Uh, taking us through chapter eight, nine, ten, and eleven, and giving us a great insight as to what's 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 taking place and what's take, taking place now, as of now, and encouraging us that there is victory in the end. Uh, we'll take some questions at the moment. I have question number one for you already. Uh, okay. We can go ahead with it. 
It says, as described in Revelation 8, the blow of trumpet represents the day of judgment foreshadowed by the feast of trumpet of the Jews, that is Rosh Hashanah. Since this feast is associated to the Jews, where do the Gentiles fit in the judgment day? Uh, well, basically, in the book of Revelation, um, God draws from Jewish imagery and applies it to the whole world. So, uh, I mean, if you're going to have apocalyptic literature, wh what are you drawing from? You're drawing from Jewish imagery, Jewish festivals, Jewish plagues, you know, all this sort of stuff. But it's, it's being applied to the whole world. I mean, basically, the story of, of the bulls and the, the scrolls and the trumpets is judgment is coming on the Gentile world. So that, that is who's being judged. Now, again, the analogy between the Jews and the church is, is carried throughout. All right. So the persecutor of, of the Jews was Egypt. It was Babylon. And we'll see that. The, it, Rome is going to be called Babylon the Great. So there's all these parallels. And you have to just pay attention to the parallels. All right. I, I'm not sure if I completely answered the question. I, I think I lost my train of thought a little bit there. Uh, what do you think, Brian? I think, I think you're, you're there because the question indicates that, you know, in all of this, where do the Gentiles stand on the day of judgment? Because this is so much related uh, to the trumpets. Right. Uh, indicating to the Jews. Right. In, in chapter 11, it was the Gentiles that are trampling on the court. And it's the Gentiles who are, are, are being... Um, you know, judged. Right. Well, thank yeah. you for that. I think uh, chapter 11, when you started off with the Gentiles, kind of gave the answer away to that question. Uh, I'll, I'll go on to the next question, uh, bro. It says, why were, there only, why were there only two lampstands who were remaining witness when the book starts with seven lampstands, that is the churches? Again, forgive God for switching his imagery around in ways that could possibly be confusing. Okay, the, the seven represents perfection and the two represents power. Got it? So two witnesses because they are powerful witnesses. They're not perfect witnesses. <laughs> if they are perfect witnesses, there might be seven witnesses. But there are two witnesses. It represents the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the church in defending against the attack. So the seven is referencing to God or to the Holy Spirit or something like that. So um, if you go back to remember, uh, two represents power, uh, four represents the earth, uh, seven represents perfection, 10 represents many, 12 represents uh, the number of God's people. So the seven and the two make perfect sense. And of course, none of it's literal. There's not two actual witnesses. How many are there? Hopefully hundreds, hopefully thousands. It represents one thing, which is the church, and it represents many things, which is the members of the church. But the reason there's two is because they're powerful. That makes not sense. perfect. For that. If, if they were perfect, there'd be seven. And the seven lampstands represents the church or the Holy Spirit. It, Again, you, you just have to take everyone one at a time. The, the, the numbers move around, the symbolisms move around, the images move around. All right, but I, I think uh, it does make sense. Uh, you know, if you understand how Jews use these symbols, I believe it makes actually a lot of sense. That's Thank a good question. You. Thank you. Yeah, the next question is the mention of Rome and the Revelations. Does it refer to just a nation or a superpower or any or many super principalities that may be on earth at the end exactly. of the Exactly. Right. What you just uh, said, that's exactly right. Yeah, in the remember I said when you look at apocalyptic language, it always there's always an actual setting. But that setting is symbolic of greater and other things. So you ask yourself, what does it mean to those people in that situation? But does it have a broader application? Of course, it always does. 
And uh, if it was only for the, for the church in the first, second, and third century, then maybe it wouldn't even be in the Bible. Why bother putting it in the Bible? I mean, obviously it's for us, and it represents all those evil powers. I tried to even use the analogy of what's going on right where you guys live. I mean, there are evil powers there that are trying to destroy the church. Absolutely. And so, yeah, so in our, in our mind, please let it apply to the immediate context. That would be Rome. That would be the persecutions. It says this regards things that will soon take place. And understand what it meant to the seven churches in Asia. More narrowly, what it meant to all the Christian church in the first, second, and third century more broadly, and then what it means to us. Because absolutely this is for us. And our situation is quite different. Yes. Well, thank so you for that. His, his thank question, you. Basically, he answered his question by the way he asked it. That was a great question. The next question is, what is the mystery of God mentioned in Revelation 10, 7? All right. I hope I can answer that. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, um, I. Th it says in verse. Let me let me reread verse six and seven. Get the context, and I'll just do the best. Honestly, I'm not exactly sure. I'll tell you that right now. All right, verse six. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it. And he said, there will be no more delay. I think he's talking about the seven bowls. And the judgment that's going to come, as we'll see in chapter 16, 17, 18, and 19. All right. And then verse 7. But in the days when seven, when the seven angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants the prophets. Well, I'm not sure, but a possibility would be to go back to Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 2 and 3. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not sure. It, it is a mystery. It says, in the last days, a mystery will be re revealed. Again, take this for what it's worth. Okay, got it? Uh, blah, blah, blah. The mystery is revealed. Uh, yes. Uh, Ephesians 3, starting in verse 2. Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace. That was given to me, to me for you. That is the mystery made known by, to me by revelation. In reading this, you may be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, but has now been revealed to, God, but to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise of Christ Jesus. So I, I see some parallels between the wording in, in Revelation uh, 10 and Ephesians 3. So it may be the, the mystery is the church, the joining of Jew and Gentile in one holy body. But I, I wouldn't swear to it, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm going to say I think that's what he's talking about, but I, I wouldn't promise you for sure that's what he's talking about. Okay? Thank you so much, brother. Uh